Good evening, welcome. I'm John. I'm a bookseller at Literati Bookstore in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. We're so pleased to welcome uh, Chelsea Beaker in support of Heartbroak and in conversation this evening with Genevieve Hudson. Just a quick webinar overview for our attendees. Uh, the chat is closed, but we encourage you to keep that chat window open as I'll be sharing links to purchase Heartbroak from Literati throughout the event. Q&A feature is available to you, however, that's on your toolbar. I encourage you to submit questions at any time. I'll read a selection of those questions at the conclusion of the conversation this evening. And live transcription is available uh, on your toolbar as well using the CC icon. And if you're watching us later on YouTube, you can always find links to purchase books from Literati Bookstore in the description directly below me, where you can also subscribe to our channel to be kept up to date with all of our at home with Literati events once they become available there at a later date. And as a reminder, you can shop for more books at literatibookstore.com to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. And if you live in Southeast Michigan, our doors are open to the public for in-store shopping. But most of all, we'd just like to thank you for your attendance this evening uh, or this morning uh, or earlier this afternoon. And Genevieve and Chelsea's case, I believe, or much later this evening, depending on uh, where and when in the world you may be joining us. So without further ado, I'll introduce tonight's author who will, be, who will start us off with a brief reading and tonight's interlocutor. Chelsea Beaker is the author of the novel Godshot, which was finalist for both the Oregon and California Book Awards, long listed for the Center for Fiction First Novel Prize, named an NPR Best Book of the Year and a Barnes and Noble fiction pick. Her writing has appeared in the Paris Review, Granta, The Cut, McSweeney's, Lit Hub, and other publications. She's a recipient of the Rona Jaffe Foundation Writers Award and McDowell Fellowship. Originally from California's Central Valley, she now lives in Portland, Oregon, with her husband and two children. Joining her in conversation after a reading, Genevieve Hudson is the author of the novel Boys of Alabama, which was a finalist for the Oregon Book Award. Their other books include the critical memoir, A Little Love with Everyone, in A Little in Love with Everyone, excuse me, and Pretend We Live Here. Stories, which was a Lambda Literary Award finalist. Their work has appeared in Elle, Oprah Magazine, McSweeney's, Tin House, and many other places. They have received fellowships from the Fulbright Program, McDowell, Caldera Arts, and their Vermont Studio Center. They live in Portland, Oregon. Please join me in welcoming Chelsea Beaker and Genevieve Hudson into your living rooms. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, John. What a wonderful introduction. And I almost got a little emotional listening to you read Genevieve's bio because I was like, oh, you've done so much. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> it's like, it's for you. right? Oh, I just love all your books so much. I'm so excited for our conversation. Um, yeah, and I'll start us out tonight with just a very brief reading. And Genevieve has requested that I read from Cowboys and Angels. Um, so I'm just going to read a couple of paragraphs from that story. I had me a cowboy once on a hot steam Friday night on a hot go all the way time. Just us together in his truck with old Angel from Montgomery playing way turned up. I wanted that cowboy, but he had eyes for another, some slack-jawed Sally from the next town over, daughter of the dairy man. Me, I'd been out turning grapes as far back as I could remember, but by then I was fixing to marry, and I had long red hair down to my waist, and I was one sunburn away from old age. After our first intimacy, I wanted that cowboy to come to his senses, and I decided he had about a week to do it before I'd tell his future bride all we'd done together how he'd kiss me each and every place. And we was one before the Lord and in the eyes of God, we was already married and she ought to step aside and abide by our blessed salvations evermore. When I met him, I was working a shift at the feed store, standing there with my tongue hanging out like a dog in the desert. In he walked, short as myself, strong legs and thick, tight cut denim, an ass high and proud as a horse. Boots of turquoise, hat to match, a rhinestone belt and a flaming pink pearl buttoned shirt. His eyes were a glassy lavender. I'd never seen purple eyes on no person, but there he was. He walked right up to me and I straightened thinking, what on earth is this clown doing in here? I was used to men in overalls and no shirt, straw hats, no grace. But then he smiled, Lord, 
the teeth on a man always did me in. Those little crooked things crammed into each other. The overall impact of them was sacred. His face was unfreckled and pale, shaven clean. His nostrils had no wily hairs poking from them, and his eyebrows were plucked even, and he struck me almost girlish, but for his voice. He said, lady, I'd like to be with you somewhere other than here. Now, I was, of course, waiting for my wedding day before becoming one flesh with a man, but this cowboy told me all I wanted to hear. I said, I'll need a white dress. He said, I can imagine you in white now. I said, I ain't got no daddy to marry me off. And would you believe it? He said, I'll be your daddy. I left the feed store saying I had an emergency. 10 minutes later, I was in his truck, panties off, and his tongue was up there. Only after all that did he tell me about his Sally up the road, how he planned to marry her in an arrangement situation. So you can't see I can't skip out on her, honey. You real cowboy, I asked him, weak over those teeth. I had never kissed a man on account of suffering alopecia in my younger years and keeping to myself. By the time I bloomed a desert rose, all the boys had turned into gut slinging men and were married right up. Now the Lord was rewarding my patience. I could see my God-given future up ahead. Of course, he said, my daddy owns the biggest cotton plant in the West. Money, I thought. Money was colorful and so was he. God spoke to me then, let me know a man like this wasn't an everyday occurrence and I ought to act. Well, you're going to be with me, I told him. I wasn't one to ignore God. He laughed, I couldn't love you, honey. I eyed the pair of diamond studded dice hanging from the rear view mirror, classy as all get out. I knew he wanted a woman of big money because that's all he'd known. I could love you. I was breathless. You and me were on different tracks. Seemed to be on the same track just a minute ago. He got stern with me, get on now, it ain't gonna happen. See me again, will you, then decide. I've got big business up at Sally's all week. Can't be bothered. That's what he said, but I thought different. I watched him tear down the road until I couldn't see his taillights anymore. I felt I had been changed. The Lord gives you challenges, my mom always told me. So this was mine. I'll stop there. Uh, thank you for reading that, Chelsea. That's uh, one of my favorite stories in the collection, and um, it was it was by my request that uh, she read it for everyone tonight. So hopefully that gave you a, a nice taste of um, the voice and tone of the collection. Um, and uh, you know, it feels like, as Chelsea mentioned at the the um, the top of the evening before she started reading, um, that like hearing my bio is uh, like a little bit of an emotional experience for her. That's because. Her and I have been um, dear friends for many, many years now. So it's an especial honor uh, to be able to talk to you tonight. Um, I've been reading Chelsea's work for so many years and had the honor of seeing her grow as a writer and as a person. And we've spent countless hours talking about craft and friendship and writing and creativity and story between the two of us. So it's kind of a fun experience, I think, to um, bring those conversations to a bigger audience and you know I apologize in advance if we break out in fits of laughter. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah I guess one of the first questions that I had that I wanted to talk to you about with this collection is um, the epigraph to the collection. I'm going to read it because it's just like a stunning little piece of writing by Dennis Johnson that to me encapsulates what's to come in the collection so perfectly. Um, <clears throat> It's from Dirty Wedding and it, it goes, it wasn't my life she was after, it was more. She wanted to eat my heart and be lost in the desert with what she'd done. She wanted to fall on her knees and give birth from it. She wanted to hurt me as only a child can be hurt by its mother. Um, and I guess I just was thinking about epigraphs lately because I'm reading a book by Matt Bell that's on writing a novel that you actually recommended to me. And in, right, in his book, he talks about how as he's writing a novel, he kind of collects these epigraphs until he has like pages of epigraphs actually for the novel that pieces of writing that he encounters as he's writing it that he thinks like feed the story, speak to the novel in some way. And then by the end, he kind of calls most of them away and is left with one or two that kind of speak as the shiny example for it. And 
knowing you, I know that you love quotes. You love being struck by a particular piece of writing. We're often sharing quotes with each other when we encounter something in a piece of work. So I guess I was curious for you to speak a little bit to like how this became that singular piece that you used to introduce the collection. Yeah, I love that. And I love that you read it out loud. It, it is so stunning. And that story to me is so mm -hmm. stunning. I don't know if you've read the whole story, but mm -hmm. I mean, it's from Jesus' son. So all the, obviously we're not like the first to say <laughs> that is a really remarkable collection, but I guess that story always stuck out to me and I read it so long ago. It wasn't it was only sort of as I was going back and doing the final edit on this book last year when I thought really hard about like, I guess what it, what was the energy of the collection as a whole? I think I had looked at each story so much as an individual piece, but then really spending time with it as a book was a newer experience and I kind of went back to that early influence, which was reading Jesus is done again after I had been, you know, a number of years and was struck again by that story. And I, I almost feel like I, it hit me different when I read it like 10 years later than when I read it the first time. And when I came on that passage, it just like, I deleted everything else I had amassed at that point. Cause yeah, I had a few other, um, epigraphs that I was thinking about or I had stuck up there are like different song lyrics a lot of times it's almost just like I'll find a passage from a song and and kind of put it there and I don't really know if if that will stay but that's sort of the energy I'm working with but then when I saw this one I was like oh that that feels perfect and I loved that it was also a nod to Dennis Johnson who was such an influence to me so um I love those moments when you just know something like titling is, can be really hard, but sometimes you just know. Um, and that's how it felt with this epigraph for me. Um, but yeah. Yeah. You, you mentioned that, you know, a lot of like coming back and looking at the stories as a whole and going back to some of maybe your source inspiration or the writers you were really reading at the time. And for me, like I, you know, knowing you for so long, have, have read a lot of these stories over the years. A lot of them I haven't, haven't read in a long time. And so when I re-encountered the collection and was opening it up, there was something about seeing that epigraph that felt really um, like foundational to me. There's like, it hit me in a certain way. I was like, this is really the right way to start this collection. And um, even rereading some of the stories, like they've changed a lot since some of their uh, as stories always do since the first iteration that I read. And um, I know that you've mentioned before that you edited some of them like even more than you thought you would when you were in these final edits with your last editor. And I guess I was, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that process of like when something feels done or returning to set to a story after years of working with it and coming to the story and thinking, you know, all right, this is, this is the story this is what it is, and then still feeling like there's a door that you can still open or there's something unfinished or perhaps even you as the writer have changed over the years. You have these new eyes, you're bringing new experiences to it. Um, I, I've always been curious about that, knowing that some of these stories have just been in the works and close to you for so long. Yeah, I think definitely at first when I was kind of, you know, my editor, Jonathan Lee, I think approached the collection so smartly and he was able to see it at such a distance that I, I probably wasn't. And so when he made some suggestions or, you know, we were going back on this final round, I was kind of, I felt like I was like prying open the vault, like a dusty vaulted door that had been locked and shut for many years in a way. And I was like surprised, I guess, too, that, um, I, I just pictured this like delightful little line edit, like moving some commas and kind of moving on and being like, well, that one's done, and, you know, and, and it wasn't exactly that. It was more in depth than I thought. And, and partly it was just him asking a few good questions and then me being confronted with the areas of each story that could still be expanded or contracted or deepened. And 
And it was a little painful to start that process, I think, because as a writer, it is hard to know when someone's something is done. And, and when you've called it done, it's like a relief in some way. So some of these I really thought were done. But when I went back, I'm so glad that I went back for that last try, because I think some of them, especially the ones that I wrote, um, like in my mid 20s, later 20s, I guess, um, there were areas of those that I did see really differently, um, especially in some of the parent child dynamics um, that I was really happy I got the chance to go back for. And, and I think they're deeper now. I think they are a little more complicated and a little more compassionate. I think uh, my first take on some of them felt as I read them again last year, like just a, just a hint ruthless. And uh, that's fine, I think, too. But but knowing that I had, um, like you said, different life experiences, different different ways of processing now that I probably didn't have access to when I first wrote that wrote some of the stories. So, yeah. Um, that said, it was a huge relief to finally be like, this is as far as I can take these, and that I want to take them. I really felt like after that it was time for them to kind of leave me and for it to be um, time to move on. But it is hard to know when something's done. I, I've always felt that it was sort of a physical sensation of rereading something and like not feeling that urge to like go to the keyboard to change it. Like when you can get through the whole story without feeling that urge, I'm like, you know, that's a hint that I kind of know, at least that I've taken it as far as I can in that, in that moment. Um, and then, yeah, space and time from something is always really illuminating. I know. Isn't that amazing? The way that like, I feel that even on work I'm working on now, like even a month away from a project, I think can give you such like insight into what you're working with because you can just feel so close to something. So revisiting a story after years, I imagine you just have like all these new doors blown open in your mind in some ways. Yeah. And it offers some space to have new just thoughts come in. Like I notice when I do put something away for a couple of weeks, my mind will drift to it and, and something will come out that maybe wouldn't have come if I had, if I was sitting in front of the keyboard with it. So as hard as that is to take the space, I think it can be really necessary. Um, another thing about you as a writer that I've always been very struck with, this is something you know, is you have this ability, we're, we're very different writers in this way. You know, I toil over like a hundred words. It takes me so long to just like type it out and I'm like sitting there and I feel stuck. And you, Chelsea and I used to live together in graduate school and Chelsea would go into her room and furiously write like 10,000 words in an afternoon. And I would just be <laughs> mind blown because that would take me like a month to write probably, but there's a way that I've always felt like you um, were almost like this open, like you, that you've said before that like, um, I think you use the word channeling. Sometimes it can feel in some ways like you're channeling something. I know you mentioned, you've mentioned before that Cowboys and Angels, the story you just read from, this was a unique experience, but it really came to you almost in one sitting. Like, and you said you felt almost like you, um, had opened up to something and you were just channeling a voice or some, something that was coming through you, the story that needed to be told. And I know you say that's a unique experience, but there is something about the way that you inhabit your creative practice that to me has always seemed like, yeah, that you just were really open to ideas and associations and story and plot in a way that was kind of like awe-inspiring to me. And um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about like what it's like for you to sit down at the page and kind of have that experience. And is there a certain like creative practices or rituals, maybe that you don't even do like right before you write, but just things that you do in your daily life to kind of set yourself up for this experience of being like really open to ideas. Because I know for me, when I do feel stuck in writing, it, it almost feels like there can be like a block between me and this like this like fully uninhibited like idea of what could come through and 
you've always been someone that I think even in like daily life, when you're, when I'm spending time with you, you're like so observant and so funny. And it's like, almost like this, like this story that you're writing in your head as you're living sometimes. Um, so I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about that. Oh, I love hearing you just talk about me in this way. So, so nice. Um, yeah. So when you were just talking, I thought a lot about how I think of story as this sort of, like, I'm, I'm having like a vision of like um, an emotion mm -hmm. over here and then a tactile uh, object or image or line of dialogue or scenario over here. Mm -hmm. And so I might be holding in an emotion or kind of exploring an emotion for myself in mm -hmm. my in life as we do as humans. And then in in life, I may encounter like a strange, a strange something or an image that strikes me or like the other day I saw this old like 19, I don't know, I'm guessing now, but maybe 60s, 70s, like Chevrolet Nova, all baby blue inside and outside. And, and like that image, I just stood there and stared at it for a while. And it's like, eventually I, sometimes like something like that will end up sort of attaching to an emotion. Mm -hmm. And then a story is born. It's sort of like, that's the conception. Um, because I'm always writing from a place of a lot of emotion, um, usually exploring like a difficult emotion that I may not really have access to in my waking life. But for some reason, when I go to write, if it can sort of hijack that Nova or like see where what's going on in that house with the windows all shuttered or um, to that family that all has the same haircut or whatever, like uh, those are the ways that, that's like the vehicle that then I can explore a complex emotion that um, for me is the most satisfying way to explore emotion usually. So I think that, yeah, there's always that undercurrent. It's like an emotional truth layered with um, something that I'm observing or hearing or, or something. And I think as writers, we're always we always should stay like eyes wide open to those images and like be willing to pause throughout the day. And, and I think many of us are naturally like that. That's why we're drawn to writing in the first place because mm -hmm. we're really curious about other people and why people do what they do. Like I was just having breakfast the other day and I kind of had zoned off. We were in a restaurant and like I had zoned off looking at this other family and, and barely I could hear my daughter saying like, don't interrupt her. She's observing. And like <laughs> Harper, my daughter like knows this about me, but like, I really like to hear what other people are talking about. And it looks, I just kind of zoned out for a while and I was over there and my family kind of knows that that happens occasionally. <laughs> and I had to laugh. I didn't know I was so obvious doing it, but I guess nothing gets past her really. So, so yeah, I think of it that way. And then and then I think, again, it's just like, you know, we do, we are really different writers. You are, you take longer on that like line level, but I think in the end, like we've always joked, like we've started, we will start writing a book at the same time and we'll finish a book at the same time, regardless, like there'll be similar length books. Like I just happen to write a lot more and then shrink. And then you happen to not write quite so much and, and you're kind of like in it in that editing moment as you go and there's no right or wrong way I, I it's really cool to see the different ways that it works but but the one thing that's a constant between us is that we're both really committed to just to sitting down regularly and and offering ourselves up to whatever is going to come and that's the to me that's the secret it's like nothing's going to come through I'm not going to be able to have those experiences unless I'm bringing myself, you know, to the, to the barbershop to get a haircut type of a thing. You have to, you have to open yourself and, and be there waiting for it in a way. So. Yeah, I really agree with that about the, like the practice of sitting down. Maybe it's not every day, but frequently in, in a routine where you're sitting down at the page, working on it, even if it's hard. I remember Rachel Kushner talking about that once and saying that like every 
I think almost every day she said she, she would write, even if she was on vacation or whatever it was. And she said like, you know, not every day is a good writing day and not every day do I have inspiration, but if I'm not there, then I'm, I'm definitely not going to have those moments and I'll miss them if they do, if they do come. And so there is something about, about that, like practice of the routine and being able to like, kind of sit with the, the boredom too, I think feels important to me. Like in this culture that we live in, where there's so much vying for our attention, I, I really notice that. Like when I'm sitting down to write now, that it's it's really hard for me to like sit with a problem or sit with the feeling of like being stuck because there are so many other ways to like soothe my mind or to like engage in some way that feels fulfilling, whether that's like texting or reading something or looking something up online that can feel. Some of the things could even feel like writing adjacent or like create creativity adjacent but they aren't that thing and so I think that practice of just sitting down and allowing yourself to even like be bored and see what happens is has felt really important to me yeah definitely um one thing you were mentioning like when you were talking about your process you were talking about like these details that you'll see and that you'll hang on to and that's something that I also really like find a lot of delight in with your work is these strange details that feel like even in Cowboys and Angels that you were just reading the lavender eyed cowboy and then again as you're reading you're saying with his purple eyes I remember the first time I read that I just thought like wow that is such a good detail because it's so it's such like so uncanny and so strange and yet it still kind of feels like I mean it's like no I've never seen anybody with purple eyes but I do it still like can exist in our world somehow and your work is always like ripe with that kind of thing. Like in Godshot to like the baptism in Coca-Cola and like these really bizarre moments that do feel like they can exist in our world, but they also let us know that we're operating in a reality where like anything can happen and probably will happen. And that sense that when I'm reading your writing that like, you know, that there is going to be like a turn of events that is going to be like one of these moments when you're like, no, don't let this happen. And yet you're taking us there on the page. And I also think that like, that can be a hard thing to do as a writer, because I think there's a natural instinct that we have as humans to like avoid like tension or bad things or to like save your characters in a certain way. Like I noticed that I have to, to fight that. And I'm wondering like, how you like kind of push forward in that way, like to just really make these things, like these strange things happen and kind of to say yes to the strangeness and say yes to the danger and yes to the tension. Like if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, um, I think I think a lot about, you know, what is my delight in reading? And for me, I love reading and those moments of absolute, like shock that that come in um where where yeah something strange is happening something unexpected but yet something that feels really true to that character still and true to the world and and then expands our idea of what that world can do I think for me it was important with both of these books to have to have it really grounded in a place but also to have the ultimate freedom over that place, which some of those details I think do that because like, you're right, like the lavender eyes, it's like, well, that's almost like, feels like a rumor. It feels like you're not quite sure if that can, ha if that is real, maybe it is probably, maybe it's not something you've seen, but it opens the door, I think, so that then your mind is just a little bit more willing to accept the next thing that's going to happen and the next and the next. And, and I really love that when, when fiction is doing that. And I love the books where I'm reading it and I'm, and the, and the thought is like, wow, this writer really went there. This writer really just threw that in and like, and did it and to see what happened. And I don't know, I think sometimes there's like a, a desire or I sense that there's a desire for things to be really neat or for things to feel really realistic or safe in some way. I mean, I think that's, that would be a comfortable experience to read, but 
I trend toward wanting those books that might be a bit messier, um, but that are trying out some things. And, and I also think like, when I really think about what I know of the world and what we all know of the world, just by reading the news one time, like these things do happen. These strange things do pile on and, and we know that that's true. And so I like to look at that in fiction because it's just so interesting to me. I don't always want to read about something that might happen for real, you know, um, even though I think all the things I read about have happened or can happen for real, but I, there, you're right that there's like, a, there's a fun for me in the danger of um, just sort of that, that shock and that mystery. And yeah, I don't know when I read it and it's done well, it's like the best feeling. So mm -hmm. I think when I think about Cowboys and Angels, I think a lot about the story that I'm pretty sure must have planted an earworm in me to, to feel inspired to write it, which was Why I Live at the P.O. by Eudora Welty. And that whole story is like so voicey and it's so funny. And, and you are kind of accepting that maybe you're in the perspective of someone that can't totally be trusted for the truth, but it's definitely the most interesting perspective in the room. So you're fine with it. <laughs> and I think that's what I really love, especially in short fiction to read, so. Yeah, well, your stories really, I mean, feel so like voice driven to me. And it's its interesting because the narrators in Heartbroke, someone once called them crooked characters, and I really loved that. Um, they are all very different people, really. And yet there is a sense of like cohesion in the voice. And there's like a sense of cohesion, I think, even, even between like the voices in Heartbreak and in Godshot. There was a review um, of your book in the LA Times and the, the writer there kind of, to me, like spoke a little bit to like what your voice was doing when she, she says like, Heartbreak is not quite of our world, but it is very much our world. It's a place where the myth of the West is inseparable from the deflation of the American dream. And um, she says, a little bit further down, you know, people named Pretty, uh, Balula, Chili, Willie, and Maple who wear blue suede shoes and go to bars called Cadillac Flats and Seashells and make declarations like Tarnation, who work at feed stores and buy things at the dollar disco. They occupy an unspecified era, mostly before computers and cell phones and the metaverse. It could just as easily be 1952 or 1989. And that to me struck me really as a truth that I'd known about your writing that I'd never thought of in that way. And to me, it, it could actually also be 2020 or 2022. I mean, in some ways, but it's like these people that live a little bit outside of the reality that we inhabit. And a lot of that I really do think is carried in the voice and the way that you write the perspectives of these characters and the language that you give them. And I was wondering a little bit like, well, first, if you agree with that or, and how, how you kind of work with language and voice and how that informs um, the stories that you tell and the landscape that you're working with them. Yeah, um, I really, I think of all of these voices, they're definitely people who are in sort of claustrophobic circumstances, right? Like claustrophobic either literally like a tiny town with not very many people in it or a store or a bar or a tiny bathroom um, a car you know they're really not able to look very far outside their world for answers and um, and then you know claustrophobic emotionally too many of them aren't really resourced enough to have the space and time to you know, I don't know, get a therapist, like the things that we might want to give them to help them. They, they don't really have those resources and those privileges. So there is this sense of, of close closing in the walls, closing in that, that feeling. And I think for me, for these books, for this book and Godshot technology seemed, and, and while there are, there are some places that it does appear 
Mm -hmm. Um, I wasn't as concerned with it for these stories in that novel because I really wanted to, to close in the walls as far as I could. And so part of doing that was having the characters be a little bit out of touch or a little bit behind. And I think in some of these towns that is already built into the atmosphere. Um, it's also, I think tied in some way to religion as well. Like there's a reliance more on God. There's a reliance more on the land than um, the outside world than your cell phone can offer. Um, and often the characters probably can't afford a smartphone anyway. Like it just, as I wrote them, it didn't factor in much. And and looking back at it, I see that it was probably an attempt to further kind of corner them in their circumstance. Um, what would be more boring than like having this woman in Cowboys and Angels like distract herself from the cowboy by looking at her phone? Like <laughs> if for this world, like that would really interrupt the fascination and the fixation that these characters uh, they're all pretty obsessive, obsessive with the, what's right in front of them. And, and as we all know, as people, like the fastest way to check out from that would be to just look at a screen. So I, I didn't want to offer my characters that option. Um, I'm really, I really admire books that, that work in technology and have that, uh, and many do now, especially, but um, for these, it, it just wasn't the right move for that. So yeah, it is interesting though. I think we can't really depart from it at this point. When I started writing these, I think social media wasn't really even a, much of a thing for me. I didn't think much about it. So definitely it's changed. In the background. Now it's in the foreground. <laughs> Unfortunately. Um, another question I had, you, you mentioned um, a little bit earlier that you said, you know, some of these things feel like they couldn't happen, but they could. And it made me just think about, um, especially when Godshot came out, you know, being close to you, being your friend, hearing interviews that you were having, reading interviews of yours. I was always really struck by the way, um, even though Godshot is a novel and these short, short stories are fiction, that you were asked a lot of questions about your personal life. And you were asked a lot to kind of explain where the source of this came from and how much of this was, you know, your actual life. And I, I always like, I mean, I understand the curiosity and the voyeurism, but I was always struck by that, like the kind of like, in some ways, like feminized space that that created and had myself wondering, like, I, I thought like, would they ask a man these questions? Like a male writer, would they be asking the same questions to him about like his personal life and, you know, where he got this information and so many questions about like youth and things like that. And was wondering what your experience with that has been and if you ever thought anything similar being asked those questions and kind of how you've handled that knowing that like what you're writing is fiction and you are such a strong writer with this like really serious like um uh like you take craft very seriously and you like take your writing very seriously and it's um and I don't know. And, and often, I often found that people were asking more about the personal and was just curious about that and your experience around that. Yeah, it's, it's funny because I think I always look back, especially with the publicity for Godshot and the interviews that I did and, and that I'm now doing again for Heartbroken. And I think when you start out I don't know, like I felt sort of, um, also it was strange because it was suddenly COVID. So you're, you're like being interviewed and you're just in your house. You're in this like intimate space. It feels like, I don't know, you, you feel sort of alone in a way, not that you have a big audience, but, but yes, I, I was asked a lot of really personal questions. And I think in the beginning, I just felt like, well, um, I'm willing to talk about that stuff because I had processed it quite a bit myself. It, it didn't feel like a super hot button for me anymore. So I thought, and I really thought if, if it helped people connect to the work and then inspired them to read it, then it was worth it to me to talk about some of the personal tie-ins to the books or personal inspiration or stories. And now 
after quite a lot of that, it's almost like, I don't know what came first. Like, I think I probably nudged open the door to being, to being willing to talk about some of those things. And then now it's just kicked open. Um, and like every interview I do, somehow we end up talking about my life. And now I, I started noticing that afterward, I would feel like, huh, like, oh, that whole time, like, we didn't really talk about my writing. Like, we didn't really talk about my sentences. Like, I would have liked to talk about my sentences because I really care about the structure of a sentence and craft and, like, literary inspiration. And and the, these are fictional stories. So it is interesting that um, it, it started to become something only afterward. I'd be like, huh, I feel like that that wasn't really what I wanted to talk about or that wasn't necessarily the most important thing. Mm-hmm. And it's only with like experience now that I'm able to kind of construct like more boundaries around that or decide, you know, I feel like I, I once heard like Lauren Groff, if anyone asked her anything about, and forgive me if it's not Lauren Groff, but I, I think it, I heard this about her. Like if someone asked her about her life with children and how she wrote and, and she was just like, well, would you ask a man that question and kind of shut it down right away? And, and I really admired that in a way. And as much as I did kind of want to know, like, well, how do you do it, Lauren Groff? But um, I admired that she created a space of pause to be like, hold on, like, why are we focused on on that when we could be focused on the book itself. And I don't know, it's still something I'm kind of working out like uh, that I think only could come with the experience of having done it now multiple times, like what, um, how to create a container for what feels important about the book and what you're willing to share um, and what doesn't. And and yeah, to think about it too, as like a larger statement um, as a woman, so good question. Yeah. Yeah. It's tricky territory. It's tricky. (laughs) It is. And it's something that I think we don't, I mean, I didn't think a lot about as a writer, we think a lot about our art and writing the best things that we can write. And then suddenly, you know, being asked about it and being asked about your life, it can, I think it, I like what you say about like creating a container of what that experience can, can be like. Um, And uh, yeah, I've always been a little curious about that. So Uh, I noticed that like we're getting close to the time to bring in audience questions. I have a million other questions that I'd love to ask you and talk to you about. So maybe I'll ask you one more and then we can open it up to the audience. Does that sound good, John? Yeah, sounds good. Yes. And this is just a reminder that um, we do have a couple of questions, but they have been answered in the course of your conversation. So for those of you who have questions now is the time to please submit them and, and I'll ask them on your behalf. Um, Great. Well, going back to the Matt Bell book that I'm reading right now that I know that you're reading as well. One thing that he was talking about um, that I also really loved, um, I guess this is also a plug for Matt Bell's book, Refuse to be Done. Um, But he talks about creating a foundation of art when you write, which is something that I kind of always loved to think about. And for him, he, he doesn't limit that to just books and novels, but music and you know tv or movies or anything that you are like I guess like looking at or reading or that you're bringing in to your consciousness as you're creating your novel or your fic whatever kind of fiction that you're writing and um to me that's really it, it is really interesting to think about it as this foundation of art because at least for me when I'm really deep in a creative project when I'm writing a novel and really in it, everything I start to see in my life feels like it's like playing into the world of the novel in some way, you know, it's all like kind of feeding this bigger picture and creating inspiration, showing, you know, what is possible out in the world of ideas, um, setting a, a soundtrack to it, whatever it is. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what the kind of foundation of art was for, um, heartbroke but you know I know that that was also a while ago that you're writing these stories so if you'd like to talk about what your foundation of art is now like what you're consuming and thinking about and reading and listening to and kind of how that fuels and sustains you um I'd love to love to hear about that I'll take notes (laughs) 
I love that book by Matt Bell. I want to give it to everyone. Um, I just think that there, I couldn't, I was like underlining every page. I feel like I can't talk high enough about it. Um, and I really liked that section on the foundation of art. I think that that really, for me, the idea of it is just realizing that as a writer, your life is art. Every single thing you're doing, once, it's almost like once you've lifted like the veil and walked through it into a project, like I know we're both working on novels now, it's like you're in that novel all the time. I mean, I'm in it all the time. I'm thinking about that character. I'm thinking about what she would do. I'm thinking about the ways we're the same and I'm thinking about the ways we're different. And often like I'll be in a situation with my kids and I'll think, well, what would my main character do or say right now versus what I'm actually going to do and say? Cause those are, those are sometimes the same things but often very different things. And and it's sort of always there. It sort of becomes this presence in the room. I don't know if you feel that way. And so like every song that comes on, I'm a little bit thinking about that world or or if I hear a song that feels like it really fits that world, I always have a playlist that is just for that book that I'm writing on. And it feels like sort of this cumulative like collage that's going on. You're always sort of adding to it as you're going throughout your day. And I really love that feeling. It feels like you're really in it and it's an exciting feeling. And, and I think the more, it's like a mental practice almost, the more you're kind of doing that, the richer the book becomes because you're, yeah, it, it, it sort of is, it's reaching into something else, some other part of life that, that feels sort of closer to the soul or something. Um, so, yeah, uh, right now, I mean, I'm really actually loving books like Matt's, like books on craft, like thinking about how other writers do what they do. I love when writers are writing about their process, anything like that. I just read a really astounding profile. Um, we'll have to link it. It's called Kate Braverman is Dead. And it's all about Kate Braverman, who is a writer who died, I think, in 2019 that I really didn't know much about, but I was such a huge fan of her story, Tall Tales from the Mekong Delta. Um, it was really influential to me and I always had students read it and really you know, I just didn't know much about her. And, and this profile is just like fascinating. So now I'm going through and I'm reading everything by Kate Braverman that I never read before. Um, and that's really satisfying. So I don't know, just kind of being open and into that and, and then creating space, right? Like, I think it's like always the daily practice of creating space and saying no to the things that aren't going to serve that like greater purpose mm -hmm. um, and, and minimizing distraction where we can, we can't minimize it all, but there are certain ways that we can create um, just the space for those awarenesses to come through. So what about you? What are you doing? I, you're, Jen is writing an outstanding new novel that I'm so excited about. What is your foundation of art looking like? Uh, oh, that's a great question. Um, I think right now I'm trying to read millennial novels <laughs> or novels that are in this space that kind of speak to like the experience of like, being alive as a 30 something person today, it, ways that do take on technology that kind of do take on this like new world that we live in. Um, some of the existential malaise that kind of accompanies the sense of millennialism. Um, but I'm also like reading pretty widely outside of that too. I just started Theory by Dion Brand. I don't know if you know of that book, but it is about like love affairs and obsession, which is on brand for this novel that I'm uh, writing. And Jen's two favorite things. Yeah. Um, and I just finished, um, no one is talking about this by Patricia Lockwood, mm -hmm. which I um, really found so, um, just such a, like a really different, like it was very refreshing in terms of language. Mm -hmm. It really like reminded me that we can, be so much more surprising and limber in the way that we use language. Um, yeah, and 
I, yeah. So those are, those are the ones that kind of come to mind for me. I've also yeah. been reading a little bit more craft than I normally do. I am definitely going to tee up Kate Braverman is dead and read that. Um, yeah, it was but, so good. You read a lot of poetry too, which is always inspiring to me. And, and poetry is always that good reminder that language can do so much more than we think it can. Yeah, it's true. I, um, been reading a lot of Ada Limon lately and she has a new collection coming out that I'm really excited about. Do we have time for some audience questions? Yes, we do. We have a couple. Um, and there are a couple that are both craft related questions that are so similar. I think I'm going to just mush them together <laughs> into one question. Um, so uh, of your rights, did you deliberately try to change your writing style and sentence structure in your different stories? If so, was that challenging in what ways? And, and another uh, viewer similarly writes, if you could uh, ask about, or if you could talk about, excuse me, your dialogue style choices um, in terms of actual formatting, for example, when you choose to use quotation marks versus omitting and incorporating dialogue in paragraph form. So I guess both questions are about how the formatting strict, the literal way it lays on the page uh, relates to um, uh, content, which is often a question asked of poets, but not often asked uh, in prose. Yeah. Um, with voice and, and sentence structure, I feel like the voice tells me what the sentence structure will be. Um, that feels pretty intuitive. I don't have exact, like I don't sit out ahead of time and think about um, like what how the voice will operate necessarily because usually the voice uh, it sort of asserts itself it's like this is how I operate because I said this one line this way it's like a it's sort of a backwards like I feel like a lot of the characters in Heartbroke say things just on the side of what you'd expect like maybe one word is off or or a word is like placed in a different way or the sound of something is off or even there they are saying uh, some sort of saying the wrong way. And, and that's usually, it cues me up to understand how they'll say everything else. Um, often in dialogue, I really like to write a lot of dialogue and then always going back and combing through and trying to minimize it as much as I can, getting rid of any extra words, anything that's repetitive, anything that fits too perfectly in um, has to go. So then I'm left with what feels like just the essential parts. And usually that the sound and clip of that is more interesting than what I originally had, which was probably just too much on the page. Um, as for dialogue tags, hmm. Sometimes the voice to me dictates whether or not I'll use them. I think there's really only one, maybe two stories in here that don't use them. I trend toward just using them because it's easier for me to stay organized, but I know that sometimes it's, there's something about it that I, I like the removal of them. It allows the character's unreliability to come through even more a bit because it's sort of this, it's not quite a, a dialogue tag it's a little bit like understated and it's a little bit woven in more to their point of view so um, I can I can enjoy that sometimes but mostly I use them what do you do Jen you take them off sometimes don't you I do I I'm using them in this I've been using them more lately but sometimes I um in my novel Boys of Alabama I did not use dialogue tags and that was in order to create a little bit more like interiority and like you said like unreliability a little bit like there was this sense of like what was real and and what wasn't I did want people to know I, I wasn't trying to trick the audience in that way but there was just a sense of like interiority and almost like claustrophobia that I wanted to create by taking them out and I also like aesthetically can think think it can look really nice and clean to not have dialogue tags. Like there's something about the look of that that I think is can be really um, just like crisp and and interesting. But um, I I do think that it like I've been trending more towards it lately because there is something like you said that just helps you keep organized and there's something straightforward about it and mm -hmm. conventional that I is is nice. 
Yeah, and I love taking them off and having the dialogue be more of a reported thing. Mm -hmm. Like the, the voice is reporting what was said. And so it's also factoring in that voice into it as well. So it's like, and, and then maybe following it, you get the direct quote. And then that's like, it's a really poignant line from that character. And it kind of bounces off of how the other character perceived and then what they actually said. I like the playing with the, them together too. Yeah. It, thank you both. Um, I forgot to mention that I have included in the chat for those of you who would like to uh, read it, the essay by Leah Mensch, Kate Braverman is dead in Guernica. Uh, that's in the chat. If you're watching us on YouTube, the link will be in the description as well. Uh, but we have reached the top of the hour. Uh, Chelsea Beaker, Genevieve Hudson, thank you so much for joining us this evening at At Home with Literati. Um, we hope to have you uh, in the store for a reading uh, in Ann Arbor uh, for your next books. Um, but until then, uh, we hope you continue to be well. And to all of our viewers, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you at our next event. Have a great night, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Good night.